All right. So in 2016, I started a research project at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology to see if we could use artificial intelligence and virtual reality to improve learning outcomes for families that need to use sign language. 32 million children around the world are in need of using sign language, and most of their parents are unable to learn it. And that leaves millions of children excluded, and some children have never had a proper conversation with any human being in their entire lives. That is horrible, and that is why we started a company out of this called SignLab that aims to build a digital learning platform based on AI to provide high-quality learning content for sign language to more than 60% of the world's population within 2022. I'm happy to say that we are on track to reach that goal, and we were earlier this year awarded the gold medal at the Special Olympics Innovation Challenge for our work. And working in this intersection between artificial intelligence and human learning, I see the tremendous potential that artificial intelligence can have to help us solve our most pressing challenges in society. But when we talk about this, there. When we talk about this, what we often forget is that how far we have come with human intelligence and how amazing it must be for Neil Armstrong when he put his foot on the moon and looked back at the planet where it all began and hopefully didn't end. And that is not everything that's happened. If you were born in the 1800s, the chances that you were living in extreme poverty was 9 out of 10. Today, we have reduced that to less than 1 in 10. In global child mortality for children under the year of 5, if you have two children, if you were a family with two children in the 1800s, the chances that one of them would die would be the chance of a coin flip. Today, that is less than 10 and not something no, no one else can imagine. The same with global average life expectancy. It was hovering around the 40s for centuries. But in the past two centuries, we have managed to bring that up to about 80s in some industrialized countries. The same with illiteracy and illiteracy, where we have turned it around from 9 out of 10 being illiterate at the beginning of the 1800s to less than 1 in 10 being illiterate today. That is a tremendous statement to what human intelligence and collaboration can do to pressing global challenges, and also a statement to the importance of the educated profession. This would not have been possible without strong social uh, education institutions and good educators. It's also not possible without technology. Technology helped us solve these challenges by providing the tools that we needed. And the most interesting and rapidly approaching technologies that we have for the last decades have been technology, wherein Moore's law has been developing at twice the pace. That means that we can put twice the numbers of transistors, a computational device, at the same chip every other year. And that has been going on for more than 120 years. And this chart is on a logarithmic scale. If you put it on a linear scale, it would look like this. So 10 years ago, in 2009, we are at the beginning of the curve, all the way down there. And our computational capabilities today are at the very top. So our computational capabilities today are morphing what we had just 10 years ago. And that is the reason why the phone in your pocket is more powerful than the largest supercomputers just a couple of decades ago. And if you progress that into the future, 10 years, that's not such a long time. We are dwarfed again with 2019 being at the edge of the curve and we being at the very top. And that is what brings us to AI. We think about AI as a new technology, but it has been a research field for a long time, uh, since the 1950s. And it's just now that we have had the computational capabilities to do interesting stuff with AI. And it promises to be the new electricity. In the same way that electricity is a general form of physical work, we don't think about electricity as that, but a what? is joules over time, joules over second. And that is the same thing that AI promises to do for cognitive work. We haven't had that before, a technology that can take on cognitive tasks in the same way as humans can. And we're going to look to how that is changing society today. 
Earlier this year, an AI, this is IBM uh, Miss Debater, faced off against a top human debating champion. They debated, should we subsidize preschool? They used 50 minutes to prepare, where the AI presented a four-minute uh, introductory statement, a four-minute rebuttal to what the human debater said, and then a two-minute closing statement. Think about that, being able to intelligently debate with a machine. That can be very interesting and open up a lot of possibilities. The uh, AI lost this debate, but in the debate it provided good of factional reasoning and it invoked moral sentiment to why subsidizing childcare was a good idea. In planning and strategy, that's also a place where artificial intelligence is rapidly growing its capabilities. This is Star Trek II. It is a StarCraft II. It is a complex real-time strategy game that so far we have not been able to create an AI where it could beat human performers. That recently happened where it convincingly beat the best players zero to five. And this slide is also interesting because you see how the AI thinks. In the latter corner here, you see the raw observation. This is what a human would use. We would see, uh, use our eyes to see on the computer monitor and monitor what information is happening. In the second stage, you see three sets of neural networks. And neural networks are networks of something mim mimicking human neurons, working together to figure out what would be the best move. And then you see that the neural net sees that there are a couple of places in the board where it's particularly interested in and where it wants to do work and focus its attention on. And out of that, it considers what to do next. Should it build? Should it defend? Should it attack? Or should it go for resources or do something else? The next one is going from fake news to deep fakes, which is a technology where you can use artificial intelligence to mimic someone's likeness, be it in voice or in facial expression or in posture and gesture. This recently happened in the Dali Live simulation by the Dali University. So Salvador Dali, the famous Catalan, artist, he is recreated by AI. He's been dead for 30 years. Everything you see here is fake. It's computer fiction. He has never done these gestures. He's never said what he's done. But his likeness is uncanny. If you listen to his voice, it is Salvador Dali. If you see his gesture, it is him there as well. So it's almost something liking to digital immortality. And this same technology can also be used to put your favorite actors on every movie that you see can be interesting. And to bring it even further, earlier this year, Neuralink, which is a technology with the expressed interest in merging AI and human brains directly. So what we are seeing here is wires put into a brain substitute directly to connect it to a chip that is controlled by AI. That sounds like science fiction, and it's already been tested in mice, and is now being going into sort of pre-human trials. And that seems like an interesting thing, or a very dangerous thing, and certainly both. And the founder behind this startup is no other than Elon Musk, the founder of the Norway's most interesting car, most popular car, the Tesla, and also SpaceX, the rocket company. And that brings us to what is artificial intelligence impact on education? And there's two questions. One is, how should the educational system adapt to the changes that artificial, brings, artificial intelligence brings to society. And the other one is how should artificial intelligence change the education profession in the classroom itself? And the first is to say that as society is rapidly evolving and faster and faster, society necessarily and the educational system necessarily have to adapt to that change so that those we are teaching have the necessary tools and knowledge to be productive and create value and create cooperation instead of conflict. And nobody will hire you for what you know in the future, because you will simply ask Alexa or your favorite voice assistant, or maybe you will use your fancy brain implant and talk to your AI and the internet directly. What you will be hired for is finding new solutions to existing and new problems. And that is sort of what we do today, but more often than not, we still see this massive lecture hall with a lecturer in the center that teaches with an industrial mindset, where the purpose is to get someone out in a specific job function. And that is not necessarily that that job is going to be there. And what we need to do is change the mindset to creating general problem solvers. 
And in addition to that, as things are going faster and faster and faster, it is more difficult to predict which jobs are going to stay, which jobs are going to go away, and which jobs are going to be created. And in, in, in addition to creating general problem solvers, we also need to embody resilience and adaptability. That is, resilience to adversity and change, and also being able to combine that kind of opposite force, being able to adapt to the environment as things are changing. And the last thing is to introduce problem solving using AI in schools. And here I'm not saying that everyone should learn to code, I'm not saying that everyone should learn to be an AI trainer, but I'm saying that they should be able to recognize what kind of tool AI is and when it is best applied, in the same way that we teach electricity and how that it generally is and what problems it solves. And here, I, I live in Oxford, but I do follow the Norwegian debate, and this might seem controversial. But here I got to say, there is a difference about saying what is needed in the workforce and how the educational system needs to cater for that and how that is actually implied in the classroom. The latter, that I'm not an educator, that is something else, and that is a legitimate debate. And then we come to artificial intelligence in education itself. And first, if you have ever been an educator, and I think most of us at some point have been an educator, make this thought experiment. How is it if you are teaching one or if you're teaching many? Who would get the best learning outcomes? And most of us will say that the best learning outcomes would come if I teach someone one-on-one, -on -one, instead of teaching a group. And then the question becomes, and you will be correct in saying that, and then the question becomes, why is that? And by how much? By quite a lot. So Benjamin Bloom is a famous educator that in the beginning of the 80s conjured up the Bloom's Two Sigma problem. He took two populations, one that was taught one-to-one -one by a qualified educator compared to a classroom approach. The difference between the average of the conventional classroom, which you see with the purplish line in the beginning, and the one-on-one -on -one teaching mentorship, which is the uh, brownish line, is two sigma, two standard deviations. And that difference implemented is taking the average student in a classroom today, in any class, be it arts, the sciences, whatever, you can, with one-on-one -on -one tutoring, bring them up to the top 2% in that classroom. That is the same as taking an average class in a classroom today and bringing it up to the top 2% of their entire school year in a traditional, typical Norwegian school. That is quite a lot, so something is happening there. And the challenge for us is to figure out how we can bring the future average in the classroom up to today's 2%. And this is where I believe that artificial intelligence provides a new tool in the educator profession to achieve that. But what that is, I'm not qualified to say. That is up for us to figure out together. And I think that the interesting way of checking out this, it would be if you, as an educator, had unlimited time in the classroom, what would you do differently? And that is not something you have, but there is something going on there, what you would do with the students, what you would do with the teaching materials, how you would do assessments and evaluations, personal tutoring. And then go back and say that I do not have unlimited time and figure out the difference between what you would do with unlimited time and what you have at unlimited time, and then figure out if there is a way that we can bridge the gap using technology. And I there I think we have come some way with EdTech today, I think we are working on it in our company, but I also think there is a lot left to explore, and especially with AI that is adapt to this emerging environment where there is a lot of dynamic variables that cannot be pre-programmed, it cannot be premeditated. what this program needs to do in able to bridge this gap of two sigma. So that is what I leave with you today, uh, and I hope you would use your fellow attendees uh, and the presentations for the rest of the day to discuss that and see if we can make some progress. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Andre. And um, thank you, first of all, for letting me understand that I have now the possibility to have Arnold Schwarzenegger on every movie I watch. Yeah, right. Wow. Exactly. But apart from that, I guess what you tell us here today is kind of unknown territory for me, at least. Uh, I am also, as an educator, rather unprepared for AI in education. Mm. To you, what do you think our current educational system is least prepared for when it comes to the entrance of AI? No. To, to your first question, I got to say, I think we are, in general, unprepared when it comes to AI. I think it is difficult, even developing AI ourselves, to see what is going to happen five, ten years down the line. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the current educational system and response to what I think AI will bring, I think we are crucially missing how we're going to re-educate or help to continue to educate the people already in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So I think we are pretty good at the education system from when you enter preschool up until finishing university. And I think that that structure is in place, and that can change. But what we are forgetting is that there is a huge population in the current workforce that have no ability to go back to the universities, at least where, it, where there needs to be a big change. So I was involved with the Ministry of uh, Education and Research. We were, I was sitting in the MOOC commission here in Norway, trying to figure out how we could use new technologies in higher education. And one of the things that we looked at was to stretch out the current capabilities of Norwegian universities, such that anywhere where you were in the country, you could have access to the resources, to the courses that is currently being taught. And I think that is something we need to work on and develop such that it meets the requirements of a changing workforce in a more dynamic way. Mm -hmm. I, as an educator, um, in the classroom, what would I have to be extra aware of when it comes to AI? Right, so, so I'm, not, I'm a technologist, mm -hmm. and I'm not an educator. So I can speak from the technologist perspective that bringing AI into any environment that is complex and human control, it also brings in some of the biases that is inherent to human society. So for instance, there have been instances where we have trained AI systems on decades of decades of digital books to try to teach the AI how human society works, how we think. And what it ended up with is that it also taught, or learned rather, the inherent human biases in society. So for example, if you would give it th this AI a sentence saying that, should the pronoun be he, he, he or her when it comes to being a nurse or a doctor, the AI had presumed that the, uh, the nurse would be a she and the doctor would be a him. And that is biases that it has learned from us. It has not conjured this up by itself. And something that we need to be conscious of, that we bring these biases potentially into artificial intelligence when we put it into educating our population. Mm -hmm. I started this questions, these questions with talking about Schwarzenegger. Mm. And I guess many of the people here in the room watched Terminator. What do you see as the main risks when it comes to AI? And after that, I'm going to ask you, of course, about the qualities in education. But are there risks that we, ha that we have to be aware of? Yeah, I, I think AI as any tool, as we have seen here also with technology, with the internet, social media, it has risks. Mm -hmm. Tools can be used for good. Taurus hammer could be used both to build and to destroy. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to realize that artificial intelligence is an incredible tool and a potential to do great harm. And I think it can, I think it has done great harm to our democracy. I think we have seen that, and I live, now live in the UK, so Brexit is a thing. That has been documented, very interesting artificial intelligence used to control social media to get the election the way that the Russians would like it to be. So that definitely, I think that is very dangerous and something we should think ahead and premeditate what, possibly can, what possible can happen. Uh, before we, we accidentally do something. Mm, good actually. point. What, what about the qualities in the classroom, in, in education? Where do you see the main qualities in AI? So the qualities is to be a good support. Mm. So I do not think that the educator profession is going away. I, I don't think that at all. I think that is one of the least likely professions to go away. I think that we can enhance teaching materials, such that when we now teach uh, parents in India and Indonesia, they don't have access to a sign language teacher. So there, we will have to provide something that can teach something by itself. But here in Norway, the situation is different, and there we work as a supplement to an educator. 
and it provides a lower kind of barrier for where we can be at, and then the human will augment that even further. That's how I see it. Andre, thank you so much. Thank you.